Um, yeah, so kind of recapping where we were last time. Last time I was talking about the, the rise, the peak of papal power. And specifically, I was talking about how papal power reached its uh, zenith in Pope Innocent III. And I talked about major popes like Gregory VII, uh, Alexander III, and then Innocent. You know, these guys who, who did certain things that increased papal authority. I gave some of the reasons, a lot of the politics. Um, and so we're going to finish that lesson, and then I'm going to roll right into the next lesson, which is papal decline. Uh, and so the last thing I talked about was Innocent, Pope Innocent III, and how he really consolidated power. When he took over the papacy, it was in a weak, or papacy, he was in a, it was in a very weakened state because of what the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor had did, done to it. So Innocent, bit by bit, regained central Italy in the Papal States. He ended up working out these alliances, getting people loyal to him, um, and even set it up to where there was now a civil war in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and so he told Otto, he said, I will crown you, but it's going to be on a condition. And the condition is going to be that um, you, you never can invade northern Italy again, and you got to leave Sicily alone. Um, and, and then, of course, he set it up to where um, the son of the previous Roman emperor, he made the heir to Sicily. So he's got all these guys who now supposedly have to be loyal to him um, and pledge not to attack his papal territories. And so that's kind of where it was at. Now he's a head of state in his own right. Um, and remember how I talked about the popes now have these tools, right? Excommunication, interdict, and the ban. Well, Innocent's going to be the one that uses them the best, and this is why he's going to be the most powerful pope in history. So I mentioned last time that what he decided, or not what he decided, but what needed to happen was he needed to test his power, and he tested it on the three most powerful monarchs of Europe. And so the first one is the same guy, Otto, in 1209. So he crowns Otto the Holy Roman Emperor. And remember, Otto had to promise not to invade northern Italy. He broke his promise in 1209, tried to reconquer actually southern Italy to get to Naples in order to regain Sicily. So what Innocent does is he uses the first tool of power, excommunication, and instead, what he did is he took Henry VI's son. Henry VI was the previous Roman emperor. He took his son, Frederick II, who he made ruler of Sicily. He said, I will make you the Holy Roman Emperor, but you have to give up your claim to Sicily. Sicily will now be under the, um, the sphere of influence of the Pope, but you will have the Holy Roman Empire. And so, of course, if you're Frederick, you're definitely going to go with that. Um, and then he's like, but we got to win, right? Because we're being attacked by Otto. Well, the Pope, because of previous things that happened, um, already had the King of France on his side, uh, Philip Augustus of France. He has him on his side. If you remember, Philip Augustus was uh, King Richard's partner in the Crusades, but now he's back in France. And, uh, and, and pretty much Philip Augustus is on the side of the Pope. So he takes Philip and he puts him in alliance with um, with Frederick. And so now you have this international alliance. It's almost like a multinational European war. Well, Otto forges an alliance with King John of England. So it's Germany and England versus France and Italy. And then the Pope's obviously on Italy's side. And so he is actually heading the first great conflict of international military alliances in European history. Like what's going to become normal later in European history of multiple countries always jumping in and fighting each other. This is the first time. And the Pope led the winning side. In 1214, the Papal Alliance won a decisive victory at Bovines. I'm not sure how you say it, in modern Belgium. It was France at that time, though. There was no Belgium back then. Uh, and pretty much because they won, Otto was out and Frederick was in. He is now crowned the Holy Roman Emperor. And if you remember, this is the Frederick of the Sixth Crusade. Okay, so sometimes these names sound like they're reappearing. This is the Frederick that walked to Jerusalem and negotiated the Muslims into giving it to him. And so then he became the ruler of Jerusalem. And then after he died, they're like, what? They came back and reconquered it. But this is that Frederick, the guy who took multiple wives, walked around like he was a sultan. And even though he's loyal to Innocent, he's going to have a lot of conflict with the popes that come after Innocent. So yeah, he becomes the emperor because of the pope, but he's not a true friend of the papacy. But in this case, Otto, who was the emperor, he's now out. So the Pope won. See, these conflicts, and, and one thing to point out about this conflict is 
the Holy Roman Empire was completely weakened after this. You know, they have been the heavy hitter in European history a lot of the time from Charlemagne to now. Okay, but these civil wars and their battles with the Pope and all that, it weakened the position of Holy Roman Emperor to the point where now the local rulers, which were the counts, the dukes, and the princes, pretty much the individual states of Germany, have, they, they win back their power. Germany is not going to be centralized again until the 1800s under Otto von Bismarck. Okay, so when we're talking about the Reformation and Martin Luther, the reason why the Pope could say kill him and Martin Luther doesn't get killed, and by the way, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Charles V, was on the Pope's side. But there were princes in Germany who said, hey, Pope, or hey, Charles, go pound sand. They didn't listen to the Pope or the Emperor because the power shifted. Uh, Germany became almost like a, a loose confederation of, of states, kind of like we were. Um, and so, so pretty much they're able to resist centralization. This is definitely going to uh, work to Martin Luther's advantage and stop him from being killed. And this was part of Innocent's plan to begin with. The greatest threat to papal power this entire time has been the Holy Roman Empire. If you could decentralize it to where now it is disunited, they're never going to be able to move in on the Pope uh, again, at least not in the way that has happened in the past. So, first major emperor, humbled. He removed one and replaced him. And this was the big dog, the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, the next big dog is Prince John, who's actually King John, but I call him Prince John because of Robin Hood. That, that mean little lion that's greedy and cowardly, you know, and the little fox robin. Has, well, anyway, that's not, <laughs> this is that John that is depicted by the lion. Um, so he was King Richard's brother. King Richard's dead now. So Prince John becomes King John. And he and Innocent, the, he and the Pope Innocent III are going to have a clash. And Innocent's going to display even greater success over King John. So here's how it works. John selected who he wanted to be the Bishop of, Archbishop of Canterbury. Innocent said, nope, I want it to be Stephen Langton. And remember, this goes back to the investiture controversy, which I talked about last time. Who gets to pick bishops? Is it the Pope or the secular ruler? John thought it should be him. Innocent's like, no, that's not how it works. So he picked Stephen Langton. And by the way, Langton is famous. You all probably um, are thankful for a major thing he did. If you find it easy to find things in the Bible because there's chapters and verses, he's the first guy to put chapters and verses. Meaning when John wrote John, he didn't write chapter one, verse one. He just kept writing. This guy went and said, all right, let's try to divide this up easier so it's easy to find stuff. So thank you to uh, Stephen Langton for that. So pretty much what, what happens is, is uh, Innocent picks Langton in 1207. It's one of his own cardinals. Um, and John's like, no, I'm not going to accept him. So Innocent said, you will accept him or I will place all of England under interdict. Now, remember, an interdict if, is like excommunicating a people. England will be, the sacraments will be withheld from all of England unless the king submits. And if you can't get the sacraments and you die, you're in trouble, according to Catholic theology. And they were all Catholics, right? This works well for innocent. So John retorted, he said, Pope, and it's expel all of the clergy from England. So he makes the threat. He throws down the gauntlet. He says, if you do this, all the churchmen are going to be We're calling Europeans to go fight Muslims, infidels. Innocent is the first one to declare the power of crusade against Christians, against people within Catholic Europe. He first declares it against a heretical group called the Albig Albigensians, which we'll be talking about in one of the final lessons, right? He also here declares a crusade against England. He says, I declare all of Catholic Europe to wage war against England. We're putting them now under crusade. Now you're doing the work of God if you go to war with England until John is removed. At that point, John gives in. He's like, I, 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 can't, I can't win this fight. He realizes there, there is no victory for him in this. So he, he gives in. In fact, uh, in 1213... He, uh, he surrenders his entire kingdom. I don't know why this is not going to the next slide. This is really driving me nuts. Let me see, let me see what happens if I change it to this. Sorry. Well, anyway, if you could go to King John's Humiliation, the first slide. 
I have them all doubled. Um, one puts me on the camera, the one doesn't. So, I mean, is it frozen or is it still streaming? Okay, then I'll just hold this for a second. So in 1213, King John surrenders his entire kingdom to innocent. He's like, hey, I give all of England to you. It's now the property of the Pope. He promises to pay an annual tax to the Pope. And he says, I will recognize Stephen Langton as the archbishop. At that point, Innocent removes the interdict. By this point, the interdict was now going for six years. England went six years without English services. And so if you think about it, the English monarchy was the most successful monarchy in, in Europe at this point, but it's on its knees. John is on his knees begging uh, Innocent III. Now, the English nobles, just to give you a little side note of history, are going to take advantage of John's weakness, and they're going to fight a small war against King John in 1214. And because of their victory over him in 1215, they make him put his seal on a document that we consider famous called the Magna Carta. Um, so the Magna Carta, now just to let you know, the British make almost no big deal out of it at all. We have the Magna Carta enshrined like it's so important, and the British are like, why? You know. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's what the Magna Carta did. It was the nobles telling the king, you don't have absolute power. They're, the law is even above you, and we're going to put limits on what you can and can't do. And so while John was fighting against the Pope, the nobles took advantage, and in his weakened state, they forced him to sign this thing or seal it at Runnymede. Well, once John is back in good graces with Innocent, Innocent's like, hey, you put your seal on it, but you don't have to follow it. And so for the next 500 years, English monarchs ignored the Magna Carta. But our founding fathers are like, the Magna Carta is what started it all. And so just to let you know, we revere this document more than the people who actually made it, which is kind of funny. Um, so anyhow, that's King John's humiliation. And so then the last one we're going to talk about is the humbling of the King of France. Okay, humbling of the King of France, and that is Philip Augustus. Chronologically, this is before he humbled Otto. So maybe I should have switched the order on these, but eh, it is what it is. So here's what happens. In 1193, Philip Augustus married the sister of the King of Denmark. Her name was Ingeborg. She was 18 years old. As um, soon as he marries her, and I'm sure you could fill in the blanks on this, but not long after their wedding night, he was not happy with her anymore and he lost interest, and so he forced the French bishops to cancel his marriage. But she couldn't just go back and marry somebody else. She was locked in a nunnery and kind of held as a prisoner. So she could never remarry, but he could. Well, the point is, Innocent, this is one thing we could say Innocent was good about, he's like, this isn't right. This isn't right. So five years later, in 1198, that's when he becomes Pope, he takes up her cause. And Philip is now already trying to enter a second marriage. And so Innocent says, all of France is now under interdict. Nobody in France could receive the sacraments until Philip backs down. He must remarry or reconcile with Ingeborg. Um, so Philip, though, he holds out. You know, his country doesn't need the sacraments because he wants this woman. But then this woman dies. And once she dies, he's like, all right, well, okay, fine, Pope, I'll give in. And he takes Ingerberg back as his wife. And uh, there you go. Uh, you know, then the Pope removes the interdict. Um, and then after that, he becomes a loyal military alliance member with the Pope and helped him defeat Otto later, defeat both Otto and King John. So in these three examples, Innocent forced all three great kingdoms of Catholic Europe to bow to his will as the vicar of Christ. Um, so, I mean... That is the peak of papal power. Take the three strongest kings, take Pope Innocent, and he beat them all. They were all pretty much bowing down to him. And so to conclude, um, I'm on the conclusion slide. If, is clicking it working? Nothing. If you do, it's going to kill the stream. Yeah, it, it, it'll kill the stream and then it'll be all messed up. So we'll figure it out in a second. We'll see what happens when I go to the next uh, presentation. It might just be this one that's all screwed up. Um, so anyhow, uh, in conclusion, papal power reached its peak under Innocent III. We looked at all the factors within uh, last week and in this week's lesson that allowed for the ascendancy, things like monasticism, the Crusades, scholasticism, sacramental theology. We looked at the three tools of excommunication, interdict and ban. And then we saw how three specific popes were able to increase the ecclesiastical power at the expense of the secular power. 
Uh, so, for example, Gregory VII and the investiture controversy gained church independence from the state. Um, and he humbled an emperor with excommunication, if you remember. The guy was standing out in the snow, um, begging for days for forgiveness. Alexander III, he humbled a king with the threat of excommunication. Um, and that kept the clergy exempt from uh, secular criminal law in England. And then Innocent III used excommunication in the interdict to humble those three greatest monarchs in Europe. So now that's the peak. I want to go to decline. Okay, uh, papal decline. Because once you go up, there's only one way to go down. Or there's only one way to go once you're up, right? What goes up must, must go down. And so it's not willing to, to switch to... This is weird. This has never done this before. So this is the minute they decline. Yeah, let me see what happens. Text of Christ will rise. I'll let you know when the text box part presents. Okay, you know what? Let's go ahead and if you close it and reopen it in like an instant. Yeah. Right now. And so introducing this in the last lesson, we ended with the fourth, well, with Innocent, and I talked about the fourth Lateran Council a little bit. I'm going to begin with that. I'm going to begin with the papacy at its peak in this lesson so you can see how far it, it falls or diminishes. But its peak under Innocent was at the Council of, of the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215. Um, once at its height, it's only going to move towards decline. Between 1215 and 1517, anybody know what happened in 1517? Yeah, Martin Luther and the 95 Theses and, and all that. So between 1215 and 1517, you're going to see them, uh, their prestige and their power is going to collapse. And it's going to be caused by a number of things. Internal corruption and external tyranny. Those two things put together. And then you're going to also have uh, political challenges from secular rulers again. Not the Holy Roman Emperor. There's going to be a new challenge. Um, to the papacy, and it's really going to leave it in a weakened position that it can't recover from. Um, so we're going to talk about the Fourth Lateran Council and its decisions. We'll talk about uh, financial corruption, and then we're going to conclude with uh, all the things that lead up to and come out of the great papal schism. So let me quickly blast through the Fourth Lateran Council. We're still at the peak, right? The era of Innocent III concludes with this council. And really what he did is with this council, he built the church up into a monarchy with himself on top as king, He's really the king of the church. He established uh, what were called papal le uh, legates. The, the legates, they went around as ambassadors of his office and they were appointed by him. And their job was to go to all the different countries and make sure the bishops were carrying out the pope's policies. Why? Well, he and other popes before him noticed that a lot of times the bishops were loyal to their kings. Like sometimes the French bishops take the French crown side or the German bishops. Remember, the, the popes were only able to win against the Holy Roman emperors in the last lesson when the German clergy was on their side. But sometimes the German clergy took the side of the, the emperor. And so by having this, he's able to send these guys around to check up on these bishops and make sure they're loyal to the church first. If not, they could remove them there and replace them with someone who would be loyal. So again, that discourages bishops of a country from siding with the monarchs. He also imposed the first general income tax, and we're going to be talking a lot about this, the first general income tax on all Catholic clergy. And guess who they had to pay it to? The popes, papacy. Now, the Fourth Lateran Council, as I said, occurred in 1215. It was the most attended of all the councils in Roman Catholic history of the Western councils. I got some statistics up there. You have 412 bishops that showed up, 800 abbots, and a lot of other delegates um, that, you know, that were standing in place for absent bishops, but that's a lot. Even secular kings sent representatives there to see what was going on. Now, at the council, it was decreed that all Catholics everywhere must confess their sin to a priest at least once a year, and they have to take communion once a year, otherwise they're not Catholic anymore. So at a minimum, even the most powerful people have to put themselves under the authority of a priest or bishop once a year. And of course, the communion is going to be at Easter, because by this point in history, that's, that's the only time you're going to be able to, to get it. Um, and it was at this council that transubstantiation was both defined and said, this is the doctrine of the church. Um, and it was also at this council that the, uh, there's certain groups that the church declared to be heretical, um, and they started hunting them down at this point. Uh, one was called the Waldensians, 
and the other was called the Cathars. Um, and I'm going to discuss them in a later lesson, either the next lesson or the final lesson. I don't know yet. Um, but I'm going to go over all the groups that the Catholic Church started trying to kill. Just to give you a, a, a little bit in advance right now, the Cathars, or Cathars, they were heretics. They were real heretics. The Waldensians were Protestants 300 years before Protestantism was born. And when the Reformation happens, these guys join with the Reformation. So just to let you know, Martin Luther wasn't the first. Many tried and died, but they, a lot of them died, but some of them survived. So anyhow, this is when that persecution started. Now, sadly, the Fourth Lateran Council is also um, when I would say Catholic Church sanctioned anti-Semitism became the norm. And anti-Semitism is going to become far worse in Europe because of this. The Jews that did not accept Christianity had to now start wearing distinctive clothes, sometimes Star of David's, and they had to live in segregated cities and town, and within the towns, right? <clears throat> I mean, they had to live in segregated areas within cities and towns. So you, you will be able to tell a Jew. They have to dress a certain way. They have to wear identification, and we're going to segregate them to the poorest parts of town and tax the heck out of them. And by the way, the word ghetto, we use it a lot to talk about the hood, the word ghetto was first applied to the segregated Jewish neighborhoods. So we own the ghetto. We, we invented a lot of things, just to let you know, apparently the ghetto as well. Um, but anyhow, the anti-Jewish attitude was growing throughout the Middle Ages, and now it's going to get, you know, theological sanction from the church. And so, for example, all Jews, this is before the Lateran Council, all Jews were expelled from England in 1209. That's six years before the Lateran Council. They're kicked out. Not allowed to be in England anymore. Um, and then from France in 1306, that's after the Lateran Council. And then they're more completely kicked out of France in 1391. In Spain, there was this huge massacre of Jews that happened in 1391. Same, same year uh, France was kicking them out. Spain was uh, massacring them. And then it culminated 100 years later in 1492 from their total expulsion from Spain. Same year Columbus is sent out. Jews are kicked entirely out of Spain, no matter how long they've been in there. The Portuguese then did the same thing in 1496. Now, Germany, Holy Roman Empire, did not formally expel them, but it's not because they liked them. It's because the Holy Roman Emperor no longer had power over the whole state. It was up to each local prince, and most princes didn't really uh, make too many decisions on this. But the local animists, the local people were able to persecute them as much as they wanted. So in Germany, anti-Semitism was actually the worst. Multiple times, German Christians would show up to Jewish communities and massacre the entire community. In 1349, a Christian mob in Strasbourg marched all 2,000 of its residents um, to the cemetery and then burned them all on the stake. Right there, 2,000 people in a single day. Um, See, and here's the interesting thing, and, and I don't know if, if this is, accounts for my existence, right? I clearly have a German last name, Feinstein, but it's a distinctly Jewish German last name. But all my ancestors came from Russia. <laughs> we don't have a ski in our name. It's not like Feinstein ski, you know, or whatever. You know, we don't have a Russian name, but... My ancestors that came to America came from Ukraine, you know, or whatever. So they still had this German last name, but they were in Russia for centuries. And then it was the pogroms in Russia that started killing them that had them come over here. I've always wondered how they got from Germany to Russia and when they got from Germany to Russia. It may have been during this time when, you know, 2,000 could be marched out and executed. Well, if you're going to escape, where are you going to go? The next big decentralized place where you could like maybe get away from the crown for a while was Russia at this time. But then eventually they're going to get a powerful monarchy and the anti-Semitism will, will go there as well. So anyhow, um, the Fourth Lateran Council's decisions about Jews, saying they have to live in ghettos and wear clothes and all that that you could, you could spot them out on, it reflected the deep hatred that already existed. Okay, it was already there, but now once it was sanctioned by the church, being a Jew got a lot harder. The barbarism only got worse. When the Black Death came, um, there was a little miniature holocaust that happened in Germany um, where just whole entire communities were wiped out because they said, well, the Jews must be the ones who brought the bubonic plague here. Um, 
because a lot of us didn't die from it. It turns out a lot of us have O positive blood type. With O positive blood type, you're immune from bubonic plague. I've got that blood type. And, and so, so the thing is, they're thinking, hey, these guys must be poisoning the water. So they used it as an excuse to, to kill a lot of Jews. But again, you already have to hate somebody to be willing to go that far. So here's my point. When you turn on the news and you see students at Penn State, you know, and anybody who's watching this in, in the future, this is, we're talking two weeks after Hamas brutally massacred 1,400 people in Israel. You've got these idiots at Penn State, and I do not apologize for calling them that, that are marching around saying yes to Jewish genocide, yes to Jewish genocide. You have them looking at Hamas like they're the good guys and resistance fighters, and they say that when you're oppressed, and they're not oppressed, but they're saying when you're oppressed, it's okay to be head babies and set them on fire. That kind of garbage is not new. It's always existed, and it doesn't just come from white Europeans. It comes from brown Middle Easterners. It comes from everywhere. It comes from everywhere. And so that does beg the question of why. Like, why anti-Semitism? So um, I, I do want to address that just a little bit. Now, going back to that time, Catholic communities spread rumors um, that, you know, to justify their hatred that, well, Jews are murdering Christian babies. And no evidence for that, but well, we must be kidnapping their babies and killing them. And we must be stealing communion wafers and making a mockery of the body and blood of Jesus. Now, these rumors were absurd. Just like the Roman Empire rumors were absurd of Christians, these ones were absurd of Jews. But people believed them. And so what this showed is at that time, the Gentiles were ignoring Paul's exhortation in Romans 11 not to be arrogant towards the natural branches. Um, now, some people trying to say, why? Like, why does this happen? The most common answer given, and even uh, Needham gives this answer in his church history, is that the, the economic um, success of the Jews. Um, and, and one of the reasons is the Catholic Church forbid usury. Usury is the ability to lend money at interest. So Catholics cannot lend money at interest to other Catholics. Well, Jews weren't Catholics. So if you want, nobody's going to lend money for free. You know, you don't have all these kind Catholics saying, okay, I'll just loan you the money at no interest. They didn't loan the money, right? And so who could loan them the money? The foreigners that lived in their midst, the Jews. And they did loan the money at an interest. And sometimes if you are really in debt and you can't pay it back, if you kill your debtor, or the person you owe the debt to, hey, maybe you don't have to worry about it. So a lot of times people say that the reason why the Jews have been hated in European history is because the, the majority of anti-Semitism comes down to Christians not liking these Jews having economic power over them. But I'm going to tell you something. All of these theories fail. Um, at the bottom, I mentioned the typical theories. I, the first one I just mentioned is economic theory. The other one, the next one's chosen people theory. Uh, another one's scapegoat theory, deicide theory, outsider theory, racial theory. And, and here's the thing. People try to say there's got to be a rational explanation for Jew hatred. Well, one, it only goes towards us. <laughs> You know, now everybody gets pooped on at some point in history, but it seems like it's consistent for, for Jews. Economic theory is simply that, uh, again, we're rich or whatever, and so people are jealous and they want to hurt us for that. Now, a simple litmus test discredits these theories, and a litmus test is a, a test of science, but you could also put a social science variant on it. And when you do, here's, here's what the test says. If you're saying that something is a cause of an effect, if you remove the cause, then the effect should go away, right? That's, that would be the fact of it. If A causes B, then if you get rid of A, B should go away too. So you could test each of these by saying what happens if you remove the supposed cause. If it's economic success that makes people hate the Jews, then that means if you have poor Jews, nobody should hate them. But at the same time, some Jews were the richest in Europe. There were some Jewish communities that were the poorest in Europe. The Warsaw Ghetto was the poorest group of Jews ever in Europe. And they were the first ones, or one of the main ones, to be brutally wiped out by the Nazis. It didn't matter whether they were poor or rich. So again, you remove the cause, but even the poor ones were hated. In fact, they were made poor by being forced in the ghettos you know, early in European history, and they were still hated. Okay, so then the sec second one is like, well, if they're so arrogant, they claim they're the chosen people. You know, so if they would stop just saying they're better than everybody and stop saying they're the chosen people, um, nobody would persecute them. But Christians think they're the chosen people. Muslims think they're, they're the chosen people. Even the people of Japan thought they were the chosen people of the Shinto gods. Um, and, and here's the crazy thing. In Germany, in the 1800s, the Germans so, uh, I mean, the Jews so abandoned 
their Jewish identity, they said Berlin is our Jerusalem. They said Germany's the peak, or Germany's the peak of civilization. You know, so Berlin's our Jerusalem. We want to be like the Germans. These are the best people who've ever lived, and they invested themselves completely in the German society. They weren't claiming themselves as the special chosen people. They were like, man, we like being German. We like being with these people. What's the country that did the Holocaust? You know, so the whole chosen people theory, that doesn't work. The next theory is uh, scapegoat theory that, well, what happened is guys like Hitler and, and guys like Martin Luther and, and people during the Black Death, they needed a good scapegoat. And so once you blame somebody for something and the people believe it and they get riled up um, and they start killing them, then that's what then leads to them hating them. But it's not true. A scapegoat has to be somebody who's already hated. If somebody were to say, listen, you want to know why we have inflation? It's not Biden. It's the midgets. It's those midgets. You know, and let's say, let's say like the government calls on firing all midgets from their jobs, making them wear little midget stars, you know, and stuff like that. Do you think the people are going to go along with it? Most people are going to be like, you leave those midgets alone. They have nothing to do with this. But if people already hated them, then the scapegoat Work, the oh, scapegoating works. So scapegoating can't be the cause of anti-Semitism. Scapegoating can exist only because anti-Semitism is already there. And then the next one is deicide theory. Well, the reason why we hate the Jews is because they killed Jesus. That's not why the Muslims hate the Jews. And furthermore, um, do Christians and the people who say that, do they hate the Romans? I don't see people going after the Italians. Well, they're the ones who nailed them to the cross. You know, no, and it only goes one way. Let's just hate the Jews, but not the Italians. Furthermore, if people are really that angry, because you know that that anger, you know, it, it, if there's a, a national anger against somebody, it can definitely fester for a while, not 2,000 years. Consider the Civil War in the United States. That was our deadliest war. We killed 600,000 of ourselves, north versus south. They hated each other. And for one to two generations after the Civil War, Southerners hated Northerners and vice versa. But you don't have people in the South right now looking at Northern Yankees as if like, yeah, they come in our territory. We need to kill these Yankees. You know, and think about it. Think about it. the North killed almost 400,000 Southerners, you know, and yet, within 50 years, nobody cared. So, killing one guy on a cross, right? And of course, we know it's G our Jesus. I'm not minimizing that. But that's not going to lead to 200, 2,000 years of just pure rage. It's not that. We've seen too many instances. And given that it's not equally applied to the Italians, shows you it's a, it's a baloney theory. The next theory is outsider theory. Well, people hate the Jews because they're different. There's some truth to that, that whenever you have somebody who's unlike everybody else in a society, then yeah, it's called the dislike of the unlike. But going back to the German example, the one country where the Jer Jews assimilated more than any other country was Germany in the 1800s. Um, Again, they thought German culture was superior. And so they fully assimilated. They weren't the outsiders anymore. And because of that, they became doctors, lawyers, educators, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, government officials. But it still wasn't hard for the Nazis to then say, well, let's pass the Nuremberg Laws, get them kicked out of all that. Let's put them in ghettos again, and then let's eventually um, bring them to the, the um, concentration camp. So outsider theory doesn't work either. And then the final one is racial theory. Well, it's just good old racism. Yeah, maybe, but racism as a concept only came about in the, the 1800s due to the theory of evolution. So they were hated before, you know, racial theories. So my point is no answer that is ever given actually satisfies. So there's got to be more to this, and this is why I say this is spiritual. It has to be spiritual, because this doesn't happen on this level to anybody else for as long as it does, and all the reasons fail to explain it, yet when you look at other persecutions and genocides, there's us you usually can't explain it. Um, but this one, it's just you can't. And so I would tell you, it comes down to the fact that Abraham called a man named Abraham, gave him a special son named Isaac, and from Isaac came Jacob and a special nation that God has an affinity and love for. And even when they are under his discipline, Satan still knows there's something to them. And so even under 2,000 years of discipline, they're still constantly targeted and hunted down. It's only because the Bible is true is my point. And so um, I just figured this was a good time to talk about it because the Lateran Council 
pushed forth, uh, pretty much set the stage for centuries of anti-Semitism. And the big thing we are seeing play out is anti-Semitism. I mean, it, it kind of sucks, for lack of a better term, when, when my wife tells me that, you know, she's sad that uh, my last name puts a target on my kids' backs. And it's like, I can't, I can't deny that. And she's not like she's blaming me, like, it's your fault that you're a Jew. No, it's not that. It's just like, this sucks. This is the world we live in. My kids are now targets. And again, it's because there's something spiritual there. But anyhow, let's get back to popes. Okay, so before we get to their decline, just for the sake of irony, I put this here because I had to talk about it somewhere. Papal names. We know they're not born with these names. They choose these names. And so if you ever wondered why. So, um, you know, why why did they choose their names? Because if you become pope, if Albert became pope, they ask him, all right, Albert, what, uh, what name do you want to take? It's up to him. And so you're going to pick a name that means something to you. And so the thing is, if you pick a name that has a number after it, then you're identifying with all the other popes of that name. And there's certain themes you could see with these names. So if a pope picks the name Pius, they're emphasizing papal authority because all the Piuses we're all big on trying to expand papal authority and make really hard de- like de- declarations. Like, this is what the Pope could do. Key example, Pope Pius IX, he was the Pope in the 1800s, who finally declared the doctrine of papal, papal infallibility. That the Popes are infallible in whatever they say, if they say it ex cathedra, from, the, from their, their bishop seat. Um, if a Pope picked the name John... There's supposed to be a Pope of love because John the Apostle was called the Apostle of love. So there's supposed to be of love and conciliation. And so, yeah, they're uh, associating themselves with the Apostle. And that's why Pope John Paul was such a nice guy in the 1980s. If a Pope takes the name Paul, it's rigid orthodoxy, um, meaning orthodoxy of Catholicism. If a Pope picks the name Innocent, then they battle heresy. Because remember, Innocent III is going to declare a crusade on anybody he declares a heretic. Now, here's the thing. A lot of Popes didn't live up to their names. Out of the 300 bishops of Rome, a fair share were declared heretics later. Some were assassinated. Wait till we get to the Renaissance. I don't know how much detail I'm going to go into. Some were corrupt. A lot of them fathered illegitimate children. Um, One of them was so evil and so ruthless that uh, Machiavelli wrote the book, The Prince, off of watching this guy, Borgia, who became Pope. You know, pretty much the most ruthless, evil politician in Italy during a certain part of the Renaissance became the Pope. And he had all sorts of illegitimate kids, some of which became generals and started killing people on his behalf. It's just some crazy stuff. So a lot of times these guys don't live up to their names. 24 of the 300 popes were anti-popes. An anti-pope is where you have more than one. You know, one's the real pope, one's the imposter, but at the time, nobody knows which one's the real pope. They're still fighting over it. Then, of course, whichever one wins gets to declare the other one an anti-pope. So if... (laughs) If anybody ever tries to say the papacy is infallible, just take a church history class. You know, <laughs> history will kill that, that argument. Let's put it that way. Now, if we're going to talk about their decline, we're going to start with financial corruption. One reason people will turn against the papacy is because of exploitation when it comes to money. They practiced what is called simony. Now, Why call it simony? Well, if you remember back in Acts chapter 8, Simon Magus, Simon the sorcerer, thought he could buy the Holy Spirit with money. And so, of course, theologians said, you know what? That is the perfect name. How are we going to remember this guy? We're going to name financial fraud after him. Simony. Uh, (laughs) Simony. And so all forms of papal financial exploitation Uh, exploitation falls under the umbrella of simony. But then there's individual types of simony that we're going to talk about. Now remember, the Pope had vast authority over the church, and there's a lot of financial activities then that he could uh, do, (laughs) various versions of simony. And so here's the list. Annates, collations, commendations, reservations, use spoliarium, tithing, dispensations, and indulgences. These are all ways to shake people down for money, using the position of the papacy to do that. So let's talk about these. I'll I'll start with the first one because this is the foundation of most of the rest, annates. Now, you could maybe tell that the root word is annus, which is annual, yearly, okay? 
um, in Latin. And so this was a clerical tax that Innocent III started. He's the one who started this. Whenever a bishop or an abbot starts their position, they have to give the whole first year of income. Every dollar, well, they didn't use dollars, whatever their monetary form was, all the income they have to give to the papacy. They can't keep any of it. Now keep in mind, bishops are ruling a vast territory of land. A lot is coming in in tithes. They have to give all of it for that first year to the Pope. And so this does come off the backs of the people because it's the backs of the people paying their taxes to the bishop. And then the first year, the bishop's like, man, I don't have anything. Got to give it all to the Pope. Now, there's a lot of bishops all over the Western Europe. That's a lot of income coming in. Uh, and pretty much what office is the one that has to confirm that a person becomes a bishop anyway. And all traces back to the Pope, so you owe him anyway. And if he said no, you wouldn't have got that position, so you're obligated to give him this money. Now, related to annates is collations. What if the popes aren't getting enough in annates in a given year? Well, shuffle some bishops around. Okay, there's a couple ways this could happen. Um, let's say you're at a medium uh, diocese, and you want to be at a large one because it's more prestigious. Um, well, you could ask the Pope to shuffle you. If he shuffles you, he also has to shuffle somebody else to yours and then somebody else to replace the guy who replaced you. And so what it means is in a given move, there's now three moves. And guess what? It starts all over. You're now your first year in that diocese and you owe him an annate. So a collation is just more annates. It's, it's like adding them up. So it could happen from a, a bishop dying, maybe in a large diocese. So he moves the medium guy up and then the small guy to the medium and then a priest now to the small one and he gets annates from all of them. Or again, it doesn't, somebody doesn't have to die. He could just say, you know what? I have my reasons and you, I have full authority. You're moving here, you're moving here. And guess what? Everybody he moves has to give him that first year of income. Um, so yeah, that, that's one way. It's a scheme to get more money, it's obvious. Accommodation was the next tool. So let's say you like your particular job. Well, accommodation says that I want to keep my job, so I'm going to give a special extra tax to the Pope each year. I'm not giving him an annate anymore because I'm in my second, third, fourth year, but I better give him something or because of those collations, I might be the guy he moves. So then he gets more out of me, you know, a couple years from now. So I'm going to keep paying him off so that when it comes time for him to do this scheme, he leaves me where I'm at. Again, does this all sound legitimate to you guys or does this sound very corrupt? Um, it's very corrupt. Another exploitation was reservations. Now, reservations are interesting because it, it's the idea that, let's say, a, a really rich, big diocese, the bishop dies. He's supposed to move someone to replace him. But he, think, but he could think to himself, if there's no bishop, then every year all the income has to come to me. Um, and so what he does is he reserves it and says, well, I'm not appointing or allowing a replacement yet. I have my reason. And then he sends a priest there to do the job of a bishop. But since he's not a bishop, the priest is not entitled to that income. So all the income, let's say he leaves a priest there for 10 years, all that income of that really rich diocese now goes to the Pope. And then he just gives a tiny fraction to that priest. Again, corruption. That's, 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 that, that's what's happening here. Um, now, use spoliorium uh, was also used. It means just spoils. This is the idea that if somebody dies, you get all that they own. Now, if you're a regular European noble and you die, your offspring gets all of your stuff. Bishops aren't allowed to marry. Hmm, that's interesting. It wasn't long before this that celibacy became a hard requirement because if you have no children, you have no one who could inherit all the wealth you gained as a bishop during your time on earth. And so, since you have no one to pass it on to, who gets everything you've earned? You get to enjoy your wealth as a bishop while you're alive, but when you're dead, it all goes to the Pope. And so sometimes they're just waiting for people to die. Um, you know, so that's another scheme. And then the next example of simony was tithing, but not biblical tithing. You go back to the Crusades. Um, it started out as a crusade tax. The bishoprics had a lot of property. And so the Pope's like, look, you guys need to pay an annual property tax to help fund the crusades. Well, by the 1300s, the crusades are over. But the Popes have been used to getting that money for a couple hundred years. So they just said, well, it's not a tax anymore. It's just tithing. 
And so, yeah, not the same as biblical tithing. And then another tool was dispensations. Uh, this is a complicated subject because um, there's a lot of ways dispensations were used. Like, for example, a dispensation, if, if, a, if a, like the Franciscans want to be recognized as an order, the Pope grants them a dispensation and it recognizes them as a holy order. So this word dispensation can be used in a lot of ways. In this case, a dispensation is where you are rich, you committed a religious crime, you could potentially get excommunicated, but if you pay money, the Pope could grant you a, disp a dispensation, which then clears you of any consequence for your crime. So let's say you commit adultery or something like that, and it's like, hey, you're going to be excommunicated. All right, how much, Pope? And $100 or whatever. It's going to be a lot more than that. But then he pays it. The Pope, papacy, offers a dispensation and nothing happens to the guy. That's another example of financial corruption. Um, so yeah, just definitely uh, not good. And then uh, the final form was indulgences, and I already taught you about these, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hit it too much. Uh, I'm not gonna hit this one hard. Just remember that an indulgence was a piece of paper with your name on it. So there's a blank, couple blanks, your name, and then a blank for how many years you get off of purgatory. So the idea is you pay a certain amount of money. And then the, the, the office of the papacy could be like, that amount of money gets you 200 years out of purgatory. And why could they do that? Remember the treasury of merits. Some saints were so good that they actually had more righteousness than they needed when they died. And so that extra righteousness goes in the spiritual treasure box called the treasury of merit. And only the office of the papacy has the ability, the authority from Jesus to take that extra righteousness out and give it to you, which can knock yours off of purgatory. So um, that was an indulgence. And they were selling them really, really effectively. Um, they, they, they just were, you know. And by the time you get to Martin Luther's time, this is going to be one of the things that sets off the Reformation. He was a believer, a devoted Catholic. He went to Rome expecting to have spiritual enlightenment. I mean, he bloodied up his knees walking up those sharp stairs. But when he was in Rome, what he saw was what the indulgences were building. And, he, and at that point, the light bulb came on. Um, and then that mixed with uh, one of his mentors telling him, read the book of Romans, because he was also tormented over his own lack of assurance of salvation. And then he just, God opened his eyes, opened his eyes to all of this. So yeah, indulgences are, are a big, big problem. And by the way, you could also use indulgences to get dead relatives out of purgatory as well. So Johann Tetzel, the famous salesman in Luther's time said, as soon as into the coffer a coin rings, out of purgatory a soul springs. So if you think your grandma is burning in purgatory, hey, right amount of money, she could be right in heaven. I mean, it's just, these, these guys make car salesmen look like amateurs. Now to, to paint what papal corruption financially looked like. A great example is Boniface, um, you know, Boniface the, the Eighth's crown, his papal crown, um, and his, his papal dates are 1294 to 1303. And so uh, his crown had 48 rubies, 72 sapphires, 45 emeralds, and 66 large pearls all in his crown. And this guy's just walking around with this. A far cry from the poor fishermen that Jesus used to lay the foundation of his church. And so that's a, a black and white picture of that crown. Um, yeah, I mean, come on. These are people using religion for money, sex, and power. That's just all it comes down to. That crown paints it all. So financial exploitation, people see this. People see this. They're going to lose confidence in the papacy. But there's also going to be political challenges to the Pope. And this is where the papacy is really going to lose its power and things are going to uh, start falling apart. Um, so let's talk about the shifting politics. Remember that guy, Frederick II, the guy that Innocent made uh, Holy Roman Emperor, the guy that one day conquers Jerusalem through diplomacy. Uh, he's going to battle back and forth with the popes after Innocence. Both sides get weakened in this, but the Holy Roman Emperor Empire got weakened more. So they're going to fall off the scene as the main power, powers, uh, main power. They decreased in prestige to where now, as I said, the local princes for sure were the top dogs. German unity would be broken until Otto von Bismarck in the 1800s, although Napoleon tried to make his own unity out of them. That didn't work. Uh, but anyhow, uh, a new political challenge to the papacy is now going to be the kings of France. It's not the Germans anymore. 
It's going to be the Frenchies that are going to give the, uh, the, the, really, they're going to be the ones who wrecked the papal power more than anybody else is France. An entire period ensues where the popes become the pawns of the French crown. And so the growing power of the French reaches its high point under that little effeminate looking guy at the bottom, Philip the Fair. I guess he was fair, but he was ruthless. Um, and so his reign dates are 1285 to 1314, and he battles with Pope Boniface VIII, the guy who had that crown. And, and, and the way the, and, uh, um, conflict was inevitable. How many of you have heard of the Hundred Years' War? Okay, so in England, a very big period, 1300s, most of the 1300s, was covered by a series of wars between England and France. It was constant to where it lasted so long where historians just call it the Hundred Years' War. Um, Philip was wanting to go to war with England, and England was wanting to go to war with Philip. And both countries in this war need money to finance it, and so what they want to do is tax their people. And who owns the majority of the land in their countries? Bishops. So they need to be able to tax the bishops. Pope Boniface knows if they start shaking down the bishops, that's less money that's coming to the papacy. So, the, you know, when people start getting money through their corrupt system, they want to keep it going. That's why drug dealers kill each other and they've got these gangs and stuff like that. And so pretty much this war, this secular war between England and France, threatens the bottom line of the papacy. It threatens their ability to get money. So Boniface decrees excommunication. Anybody in France, any bishop that pays, or any secular person as well, that pays um, these taxes without papal permission, excommunication. Now he's thinking he's like Innocent III. Innocent did it, I'm going to do it, and they're going to bow down. It's going to work. Well, Philip's like, nope, not playing that game. And so what he did is he said, fine, if nobody in uh, France could pay taxes to me for my war, then I forbid the exportation of all gold and silver out of France to Italy. Could go anywhere else, but not Italy. That wrecked Italy's economy, brought a whole bunch of poverty. So Boniface then kind of says, all right, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm not giving in. But here's the thing. The clergy can voluntarily give this tax to King Philip, meaning they can say no, and I'm going to back them. But if they choose not to say no, well, I'm leaving this in their hands. So this is his way of saying he didn't give in to Philip, but he really did. So boom, there's a loss. Okay? And he had to because Italy was being placed into poverty because of this boycott, or actually not a boycott, an embargo of gold and silver. Um, so anyhow, 1301 though, because what happens is once Philip got that victory, he then started seizing church land. And Boniface in 1301 is like, now he goes too far. He can't seize church land. So he sends um, a, a papal leg a legate, a legate there to go there and tell him, you need to stop this. Philip arrests the legate, charges him with treason and says, throw him in prison, which was a death sentence back then. Um, and so then Boniface orders him to release the person, and he summoned him to Rome. Philip, you will come to Rome, and you will face the Pope. Philip's like, I'm not going to Rome. Instead, he calls a meeting that was called the Estates General. France was divided by this king into three classes of people, nobles, clergy, and commoners. If you know your French Revolution, that was the Estates General that King Louis XVI called, and then uh, the, the third estate decided to start a revolution and eventually he lost his head. But this whole division into three parts came from this king. So this sets the stage for his descendant to later lose his head, just to let you know. But anyhow, he calls together this group of, uh, of three, pretty much to represent the whole society, and they all support the king. Yeah, king... You don't have to do what the Pope says. He puts us under interdict. He excommunicates you. No, we're, ba we're backing you. And there's going to be a reason. I'm going to explain that uh, in a little bit. So Boniface then responds with a papal bull, which is an edict. Bull just is the word for the wax seal of the Pope that makes it official. So they just call them bulls, but it just, it's a letter, right? And it was called a unum sanctum. And in 1302, it made claims for the papacy that were even bolder than the claims of Pope Innocent III. Um, pretty, pretty bold. It asserted that all political authority is subject to the papacy and that you ha submission to the Pope is necessary for salvation. Meaning if you don't submit to the Pope, you actually aren't saved. Um, and then he says the civil sword that belongs to the state actually belongs to the church. It's used by the state, not by the church, but it's used by the state for the church. 
and then the church uses the spiritual sword. But both swords ultimately fight for the purpose of the church, and so any king that will not submit to the pope is not saved, and he relinquishes his right to the civil sword because he's no longer using it for the church. Very bold claims. Well, Philip, in response to this bull, because it was bull, <laughs> he declared that Boniface was unworthy of his position, and he argued that the ultimate church authority is not a pope, but an ecumenical council, because all of our creeds came from ecumenical councils. And so then he summons Boniface to come to France to appear before a council. Now, of course, the council was going to be all these French people. It wasn't going to be universal, but he was trying to say a council has more authority than the pope. This French parliament, which was the French clergy and all that, and Paris University, they all agreed with this. Yes, yes, a council is supreme, and Pope, you summoned our king, but our council is summoning you. He's losing here. And so Boniface is like, you know what? I'm going to prepare to excommunicate King Philip. Well, before he could write the excommunication, Philip sent some knights to violently kidnap him. They, they beat him down, kidnapped him, dragged him to France, and threw him in prison. And so, and then they said, resign as Pope. He's like, no, resign, no. Resign. No. And this was going on. He was being stubborn. No matter how much they, they slapped him around, he would not resign. Um, but anyhow, at some point, he gets rescued. Um, he, 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 gets, he gets rescued. Um, let's see if I have that here. Yeah, he gets rescued by some of his allies. They bust him out of the prison. But then he dies a couple months later as a broken man. He sustained injuries during that capture. So he dies. He lost. He lost this bout. Now, you know, I mean, nothing happens to Philip for this because all the Catholics in France are going to support their king. So this power struggle was far from over. Just to kind of let you know what Boniface thought he could do. You know, it's like when you read the, 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 when you read the, um, the field wrong. He read this wrong. He thought that he could pull off what Innocent III did. He th I could just do the exact same thing and it'll work. But it didn't. He miscalculated. See, Innocent used to claim he misapplied Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. This was given to Jeremiah specifically when it came to dealing with uh, his, his call to call Israel to repentance. God says to Jeremiah, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow, to build in the plant. That's what Innocent thought God gave to the popes. And Boniface said the same thing. Apparently it didn't work. Now, the reason why it didn't work is because something new was on the scene called nationalism. Now, you may know what nationalism is. It is where you have an intense love for your country, your language, your culture, your cuisine. Before this time, Europe had a Catholic identity more than a national identity. Whether you were English, French, German, you were Catholic first. And there was a universal language, Latin, that all the politicians and theologians and, and intelligentsia could speak. You were Catholic first, and that's why popes could win. When the average person said, I'm Catholic first and French second, popes can win. But when it flops, and the average person says, I'm French first, Catholic second, then when the interests of France go against the interests of the church, France is going to win, at least in the eyes of its people. And that's what happens here. It's eventually going to happen in England and Germany and everywhere. And that is why the Pope, even today, is just a fraction of past popes. He can't tell anybody to do anything. The Pope goes around pretty much telling each country what they want to hear. So he sounds like he's very orthodox Catholic when he goes to a conservative country like the Philippines. But then when he's in liberal Europe, you know, he's given every signal that he's okay with homosexuality. You know, Popes, they're, they're, they're just shells uh, of what they used to be. But back then they were still strong, but now nationalism is starting to, to break them. And it's going to continue to break them for many centuries to come. And so again, the, these changes are really going to make it to where there's no coming back. Now, this all leads to the Babylonian captivity. Not talking about the Babylonian captivity in the Bible. It's, uh, a lot of historians try to call it the Av uh, Avionian captivity. But the thing is, they all called it the Babylonian captivity. The reformers called it the Babylonian captivity. So, dagnabbit, I'm calling it the Babylonian captivity. It's a, almost a 70-year period where... Um, the papacy is captured by the French. And, and here's how this works. So Boniface dies. His successor, Benedict the, the 11th, dies after only eight months of being pope. And so a French faction of cardinals had a majority. 
And so they, most popes were Italian, but this French faction of cardinals said, let's elect a French pope. And they did, Clement V, uh, 1305 to 1314. And he was a weak man that if Philip, King Philip said jump, he said how high. He became a tool of Philip. He didn't even rule from Rome. He wouldn't even stay in Rome. He went and lived in France. And then he, 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 since he was in France so much, he set up his court in the town of Avignon. And then he dies. And then a later Clement, okay, we're talking, you know, 30, 30 years later, Clement the, the sixth, 1342 to 1352, he purchases the land and makes it into a papal city in 1348. It's surrounded by nothing but French territory and French interests. And so the papacy then remains in France for 70 years. I mean, it started in 1309. And then, of course, they formally have that palace starting in 1348. But all the popes from 1309 to 1377 were French, and they lived in France. And here's how it works. Remember, who gets to pick the cardinals? The cardinals, the specific personal staff of the pope. And then when that pope dies, the cardinals pick the next one. So the French popes keep picking only French cardinals, and the French cardinals keep only replacing those dead popes with other French popes. This guaranteed that the papacy would stay in France this whole time, and as long as it was in France, it was under the authority of the French king. The papacy did whatever the French king wanted them to do. And so this, just think about it. The 70-year captivity has a devastating effect on the prestige and the power and influence of the papacy. Remember, the entire papal claim is that Peter was the head of the church and he was the bishop of Rome. The popes aren't in Rome anymore. And so if the authority is tied to the seat of Rome, but he's not in Rome, he's in Avion, How's he Peter's successor anymore? So a lot of people are scratching their head and asking these questions. This doesn't make any sense. This is only weakening the Pope's influence in, uh, in, in Europe. And so Petrine theory definitely failed. Um, and so there's going to be an ecclesiolog ecclesiological challenge to the papal claims. The, this Babylonian captivity, it opened the door for now other attacks against the papacy. And a lot of them are going to come from the intellectuals in Germany, in the Holy Roman Empire. Now, if you remember, I already mentioned William of Ockham and scholasticism. This was the time when he was summoned by the popes to Avignon. I mentioned that, that and you might not know why Avignon, because that's where the popes were. He was summoned there, and he was going to be excommunicated because he sided with the Franciscans that the pope didn't like. So he goes to the Holy Roman Empire, and he gets protected by the king. Uh, which was, uh, which was uh, Louis the Bavarian. And so under his protection, William of Ockham's writing a lot of stuff that's damaging the Pope. And there's another thinker that damages the Pope, Marsilius of Padua, 1280 to 1343. Uh, he was a rector at Paris University. He had to flee and be protected by the Holy Roman Emperor as well. It was, that Holy Roman Emperor took advantage of the fa fact that, um, that the papacy was in France, and so he actually invades Italy and captures Rome. And then he sets up not a rival people, but a rival pope. Now that he has Rome, he's like, the Holy Roman Emperor's like, no, this is our way to get control of the papacy again, to get it back into Rome. So he sets up a rival pope, an anti-pope, but that doesn't work out, it's very short-lived. But the arguments that these guys are gonna make are going to persuade some people. Marsilius argued that the greatest church authority was not the pope, but again, ecumenical councils. That's where this, what do all the creeds come from? Councils. Um, and Occam made the same argument. And both Occam and Marsilius argued that you have to make a distinction between the Catholic Church and the Apostolic Church. The Catholic Church is the universal church of all people saved. The Apostolic Church is its physical manifestation on earth. And the, the universal church can't err. But its physical manifestation from Rome can err, or from Avion, it can make mistakes. So the only thing that couldn't make mistakes, which would be infallible, would be something that could represent the universal, hence a council. So they're trying to make a theological argument against uh, papal superiority or papal supremacy. And so, uh, and so because of that, they said, look, the Pope's authority, Pope's authority does not come from God. It doesn't come from divine right. It comes instead from the fact that he was the bishop of Rome's capital city. That's it. Therefore, he cannot depose kings because he's just a bishop of Rome. 
Clergy also, like everyone else, so this is arguing against uh, what was said all those years ago that clergy shouldn't be under civil law. They you can murder and not be uh, put on trial by civil law. They're like, no, clergy, like everyone else, is subject to the state in secular matters. Um, and the state should be able to call church councils. They should be able at times to control church property and sometimes appoint clergy. And so some people have seen Marsilius as a forerunner of Luther and Calvin because some of his arguments against the papacy are going to be taken up and I think better articulated by the reformers. So just uh, interesting that that's where some of this begins. And this all leads to what is called the Great Schism. The Great Schism. Um, This is the next phase of papal humiliation. See, the popes being in France didn't solve problems, and eventually some of the French wanted them gone. Um, And the English were still in the Hundred Years' War with France, and every time a pope died, they were arguing and insisting the pope needs to go back to Rome because there's a conflict of interest if he's in France. So England's arguing a lot, and England's increasing in power during this time. So you can't just ignore them. And so due to various circumstances, the papacy does return to Rome in 1377 under Gregory XI, 1370 to 1378. Why did he move to Rome? This is kind of dumb. But there was a female mystic named Catherine of Siena, and she thought with her mysticism and her meditating on God that God gives her visions. And she claimed she had a vision that the Pope would go back to Rome. And she was so respected that when Gregory heard that, he's like, well, then maybe I should go back to Rome. And he did. But then he died a year later. And so the French cardinals are like, stupid mystic, let's get it back over here. You know, so the French cardinals wanted to get the papacy back to to Avion, but the cardinals have to live where the pope lives, right? And so since Gregory moved to Rome, the cardinals moved with him, and the population of Rome was a very angry mob at this point, and they were threatening violence if the cardinals picked another French pope and went back to Avion. And so because of fear of the crowds, the cardinals elected an Italian, Urban the, um, the sixth, and he'll be pope from 1378 to 1389. Uh, He wanted to liberate the papacy from French control. But then here's what happens. A few months later, those same cardinals, when the mob dies down, because now they got their Italian pope, pretty much they say, you know what? Twelve of the 16 cardinals then withdrew their vote and said, listen, this vote doesn't count. This pope is not the pope. It's null and void. We only voted this way because we thought we were going to be killed. And so instead they chose a Frenchman uh, who becomes Clement VII, 1378 to 1394, and then he and the cardinals moved back to Avion. So now you have two popes, one in Rome, one in Avion. And the problem with this is both of them could claim legitimacy because both of them were elected by the uh, cardinal of colleges. In the past, when there were anti-popes, it's because a king would declare somebody else to be a pope. That doesn't count. But now you have the same college of cardinals they laid their hands. They both, picked, uh, they both picked these guys. And so now you have two popes, and because there's no council, there's no higher authority you could appeal to than the pope. So there was no fix to this problem. That's why it's called the Great Schism. Catholicism is now divided, and Europe was split right down the middle, as this map shows. The Roman pope had the support of northern and central Italy, England, the Scandinavian countries, and most of Germany. The the French pope had the support of France, Spain, southern Italy, Scotland, and some parts of Germany. And this is going to go on for a while. Okay, so this is a mess. Sorry, papacy's not looking like it did under Innocent anymore. Now, Urban dies in 1389, but the Roman line continues through Boniface, uh, and then another Innocent, and then another Gregory. Uh, They all have short terms, but the point is, it continues... And so, again, the Babylonian captivity weakens, damages the reputation of the popes, but then the great schism did even more damage because now the visible unity of the Catholic Church was broken, and this goes on 40 years. So 70 years of captivity and then 40 years of schism. And remember, the pope's supposed to be the vicar of Christ. So having two popes was a disgrace. And here's the problem. Bishop dies. He has to be replaced. Only the pope could replace the bishop. Whenever that happened, both popes picked a guy. And then both guys tried to take that same diocese. 
And sometimes it came to violence. They exchanged blows over this. This chaos is happening all over Europe. And then you have a French king named Mad Charles, because of course he was sane. No. You know, you have Mad Charles the, the Sixth. He claimed all French papal land for himself, and then he announced he could appoint all the clergy. So now the Pope was just his rubber stamper, in a sense. But that only lasts five years. But even that five-year period adds to the papal humiliation. And don't worry, we're, get, we're getting close to, to being finished. It only adds to the, the papal humiliation. Now, a few years later, the Frenchmen, French theologians and politicians founded what was called the Gallic, uh, Gallican belief. Gallic is the old Roman word for French, France, because of Gaul and, and all that. And pretty much what they, what they were saying, simply put, if, if, if you're going to look at, at, at this belief system, it says that the Pope can only define doctrines and morals but the French church, apart from doctrines and morals, is independent from the papacy. Taxation, bishop appointments, all that belongs to the state. This is what they're arguing. Now, eventually, all the countries are going to make this kind of argument. It's going to be a while, but eventually they're all going to make this argument. And that's why the popes have no power today. Um, this will become extra problematic to the papacy in the 17th century, but even in the 15th century, it's clear that the schism now stirred up feelings of autonomy of churches in Catholic nations where they started thinking the state should have a lot more power than the church. And so a lot of national churches will start to embrace uh, this, this Gallicanism, uh, Gallicanism um, and the universal authority of the papacy was now damaged beyond repair. So what this all leads to is the conciliar movement. The root word of conciliar is council. A lot of great churchmen thought this proves we need to give all authority to a council. Um, and then the papacy could be subject to the council. And so proponents said, again, they use that argument. There's a difference between Catholic church and apostolic church. The church of Rome is the apostolic church, but a council represents the Catholic, the true universal church, and it would have authority over popes. Infallibility belongs to the church, not the papacy. So the church as a whole could be represented by ecumenical councils. This happened in the early church. And the pope exists to represent the church. But if a pope abuses the calling, then a council could depose him. And even before a council could be called, cardinals could also hold popes accountable because they're the ones who elected him. They could summon, and the cardinals could actually, on their authority, summon an ecumenical council if a pope refuses correction. And this idea now finally gets put to the test in 1409 at the Council of Pisa, you know, where the Leaning Tower is. Um, and so this council was called to fix, to end this great schism. Okay, that's why they were called. Now, it, it gets tested here, right? Um, these cardinals summoned the council acting on their own authority. And so what they did is they deposed both rival popes. The Roman pope, which was Gregory XII at this point, and the French pope, Benedict XIII, they were both deposed. Now there's no pope. And they asserted that councils were superior to the papacy. Then they select a new pope. The council elected Pope Alexander V, 1409 to 1410. You can tell he doesn't last too long. Now the other two said, we don't listen to no stinking council. So they both stayed as popes. And now Alexander's saying, well, I'm a pope too. Now you got three popes. So this is even worse. They're trying to fix it with the council, but it doesn't work. And so England and France is going to back Alexander, the new pope. Uh, Italy and much of Germany will back Gregory. And Spain and Scotland will remain loyal to Benedict. So now Europe is split three ways. Smooth move, Council of Pisa. Didn't work very well. So... In 14, from 1414 to 1418, there's going to be a much more important council, the Council of Constance in Switzerland. Remember, this is when Switzerland starts getting that reputation of being neutral because they weren't on any of these sides. And so it's the Council of Constance, and it makes another attempt to end the schism. And at this time, the Holy Roman Emperor summoned this council. So here's, and by this point, Alexander V, his successor was John the 23rd. 1410 to 1415, the council, this was made easy. He had some sexual scandals going on, so they deposed him because of the scandalous conduct. And because of that, no one challenged it. And then this council convinced Gregory to resign. 
the Roman one. Could you just resign? You know, so that we could start new. So instead of them forcing it, but they asked him, okay, the, the third rival pope, he's out because of scandal. The Roman pope's like, you know what, for the church, yes, I'll resign. And then Benedict, the French pope, refused to resign. He was being stubborn about it, thinking, well, now I'll be the only pope. Nope. Once that happened, the council then asked Scotland and Spain to stop backing him. And they stopped backing him, and with no support, they threw him off. Well, pretty much the council was able to depose him, and no one would back him. So now there's no pope. All three popes are now defeated. So the cardinals then elect an Italian cardinal, a man named Colana, and he becomes Pope Martin V. And as you can tell by his dates, he's going to be pope for a while. Stability is restored, 1417 to 1431. And then they said a council will meet every 10 years. At first, every three years, then five years, then 10 years. And this was to keep councils superior to the pope. But this is their only success because, the, you know, it's a significant council. It did end the great schism. And it did, for this one moment, subject the papacy to the authority of the council. But I'm sure you guys could look around and say, wait a minute, I don't see any councils today that have authorities over the Pope. So this isn't going to this isn't going to last. Um, you know, what this council did is it did demolish the absolute power that Hildebrand and Innocent III set up. It was replaced by a more democratic form. But once Martin V was in power... He was not a friend of the councils or of the movement. He fought fiercely with the next two ecumenical councils. And then his successor tried to disband the council. You guys no longer exist, but they refused. And then something's going to happen. And by the way, his successor is Pope Eugenius IV, 1431 to 1447. It's kind of interesting what happens during this time. Byzantine Empire still exists, but it's hanging on by a thread. The Turks are close to conquering Constantinople. We're in the 1400s now. They're going to conquer it at this time. The Patriarch of Constantinople, the great rival of the Pope, and the Emperor of Byzantium come to Rome, and they are received by this Pope, and they say, we will reunify with the Catholic Church, and we will fall under you and your authority if you can save us from the Ottomans. And so it looks like there's going to be a restored church. Um, and this was the Council of Florence. And so this Pope's prestige is at all time high. The Europeans are like, wow, what a Pope. You know, look, look what he's been able to pull off. Well, here's the thing. The council gets petty at this point. They're like, he made this decision without council approval. He had no right to do this. So they tried to depose him. But then this caused almost everybody in Europe to turn against the councils. Like, are you crazy? Are, are, are you crazy? And so they turned against the whole conciliar movement, questioned it and said, no, we should have never put a council over popes. And so they try to crown another pope. And then people in Europe are like, are you kidding? You're going to put us back into the great schism again. And so at this point, nobody was willing to support the councils. They all switched sides. Even the Pope's biggest opponents now came and started working for him and became papal staff. The councils had no one. So it was formally dissolved in 1449. The conciliar movement was over. And by the way, don't get your hopes up about a Western-Eastern reunion. It fell apart pretty quickly. <laughs> but, uh, but the idea that it was going to happen really hyped a lot of people up. Um, so the idea of councils did live on. Even the reformers would bring it up at times. And think about it, the Presbyterians live off this model. They're called synods. Where do we get the canons of Dort? From a council. So this idea is something that the reformers will run with. But in Catholicism, not really. Um, you have Vatican I and Vatican II, which are two examples. But the Pope called those meetings. So, um, yeah, this really never picked up steam in Catholicism anymore. So the Pope was now again the head of the Western Church but it was severely weakened after all these events. This is why by the time you get to 1517, a feisty German friar will be able to turn Europe upside down in a good way and restore the scripture to its proper place. So in conclusion, we'll be done because I know I've gone longer than normal. In conclusion, the papacy continued to decline until the dawn of the Reformation. Financial corruption and political opposition broke its power. Um, if you could uh, cut that. Um, internal power struggles between popes, anti-popes, and councils only exasperated this. They once did. And so in an upcoming lesson, we're going to see that even in their weakened state, they could still persecute groups that attempted to break away from the church, but they'll never have the power that they had in the time of innocence.